Good evening. My name is Jeff Beck. I'm the director of admission here at Trinity Pauling School. We'd like to welcome you to the 2023 mm -hmm. Trinity Pauling School State of the School. And uh, we, we want to thank you for joining us uh, for the conversation tonight with head of school, Bill Taylor and board president, Eric Olstein, uh, class of 1986 and parent of 11, 14 and 17. Uh, we hope you are excited to hear more about Trinity Pauling's 2022-2023 academic year and the strategic goals we have been working towards. Uh, if you do have questions throughout the session this evening, please feel free to submit them to the Q&A as we will do our best to get to them. We also were fortunate to have a handful of questions that were submitted this evening uh, prior to the event, and so we will be getting to those as well. Our goal is to keep this to around one hour to this evening uh, to respect everybody's time and also for those in the Northeast to be able to enjoy some of this nice weather. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like our, uh, our other panelists here to introduce themselves and then we'll get started. Good evening, everybody. I'm Bill Taylor. I'm head of school at Trinity Pauling. This is my eighth year uh, as head of school. It's my 21st year at, Trin at Trinity Pauling. I began my career here. Uh, then I left in 2001, and I was head of a day school for 14 years before returning in 2015. And thank you for spending some time with us this evening. I'm Eric Olstein, class of 86, president of the board. My three sons uh, attended Trinity Pauling, as Jeff alluded to, 11, 14, and 17. And also my brother attended Trinity Pauling. I had the honor of being co-chair of the search committee that found uh, Bill Taylor to come join us and Thrilled to be working with them. When he says eight years, it just seems like the time has gone by very quickly, Bill. It has. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, you know what? We had one question that that came through that uh, actually kind of frames the whole conversation that we're looking for this evening. So I'll read that question and I'll let you all kind of take it from there. But that question was, what are the five or six key metrics that the board and the administration consider key to long-term success? And, and how are we doing? How, how are we able to measure that? So uh, I think that kind of really sums up what we're looking to address tonight. So we'll start with that question. So, I think so, that is a great question. And uh, and one that I know that the board is, is top of mind for the board. So Eric, I'm going to let you start and I'll, uh, I'll add. Okay, sure, Bill. Well, of course, there's the financial sustainability of the school. That's, that's kind of an easy one that um, that's easy to have the metrics on. Uh, of course, we'll be talking tonight about the strategic vision, which covers a broad spectrum of the school. And uh, the board has set that strategic vision and measuring along with the head of school. Uh, we'll look at those metrics. On the board itself, we also have committees, uh, whether it's school life or financial or even governance, which we're constantly checking ourselves on those metrics. And we have also have an outside advisor that we've hired some years ago to come in every now and then and challenge challenge us to what we believe and we're measuring them. Uh, it was brought about four or five years ago. So um, we, we not only just check ourselves internally, we do have someone come in from the outside to, to challenge our thought process and at times check us to make sure we're striving and always looking forward and innovating. And I would, I would add to that because this was certainly something that I was looking at uh, in, in the process of making my decision to leave one school and uh, and join another, and that is, you know, what you know. How does the board see itself, and uh, what is the role that the board uh, assigns to itself? Uh, you know, a, a board's role should be strategic. Uh, you know, optimally, it's generative. Uh, you know, creating generative force for an institution. Uh, and you know, what I was really trying to make sure we didn't have at Trinity Pauling was a board that was really, you know, too far into the weeds of the operation, because then that can, you know, that can get very blurry very quickly. And, uh, and thankfully, um, you know, this board is not that. And, uh, and that proved itself. And this, this would be a metric that I would throw out there. And that is a, a, a school's ability to adapt to change, especially unexpected change. I mean, everything is always changing and schools need to learn how to adapt without losing their sense of identity. And uh, and that sense of identity would be yet another metric of, of success. Uh, but the adaptability and, and uh, you know, when I think about the state of the school this year and how, how the school uh, 
function this year, the, what comes to mind is that we were much more back to normal, uh, whatever, however you may, may want to define that, but, uh, you know, much more back to normal uh, coming out of the pandemic uh, and, you know, the, the strength of the relationships were there, uh, unfettered by masks or uh, higher levels of anxiety caused by the pandemic. Uh, and we were able to really do the work that we excel at. And uh, and part of that also was sort of being able to make sure we had, you know, traditions coming back and we were teaching the traditions. Uh, one of the objectives for uh, the prefects uh, the, at the beginning of this year was to really make sure that we that we honored the school's traditions, that we sought to teach that those traditions to the younger students, that we didn't uh, we didn't lose sight of them. Uh, and I see, you know, where that really has come into play on a daily basis or almost a daily basis is chapel. Uh, the, the chapel has always been a, an important, critically important place for the community to gather as a community. Uh, and those, you know, and that, that was, you know, that was really maintained through, uh, COVID, even though we couldn't meet in the chapel, we had gatherings. And so when we could come back in, in spaces like the chapel, that was very, very important. Um, another critical metric in the success of a school is the, uh, the strength of its faculty and the faculty's, uh, ability to grow and adapt uh and uh and to strengthen and we're going to talk a little bit about that as we talk through the uh the uh strategic vision that uh that was passed about a year and a half ago and we've had a we're sort of a year and a half into its its pursuit um and uh and another metric is one that we've just completed and that is the uh accreditation process every independent school in the country is subject to some form or fashion of uh, accreditation if they belong to an independent school association like Trinity Pauling does in the state of New York. And for, for Trinity Pauling, that's a 10-year accreditation process that's followed up five years later with sort of a check-in. And it's a very thorough deep dive into, into what where the school is, where it's been, and where it wants to go. And also, as importantly, how will we know we're making progress? And then we are reviewed by a, a group of our peers uh, who writes a report and helps us <laughs> reach those objectives and goals uh, as we move forward for the next 10 years. And, uh, and we have gone through the, the visitation process. We've completed the self-study. We're waiting on the, on the final report. And... Uh, and but it's been a very healthy process the last two years where we've been able to do a real deep reflection into what we do well, what we'd like to do better, and and how are we going to get to those places where where we're achieving those goals of growth. And I think from an admission standpoint, a lot of the families that are connecting with us are are kind of wondering what's next, what's the next step for their son, right? How are we going to get their son to uh, to, to college and beyond and be prepared for uh, the, the world that we do live in. And so I think a lot of what, what you just kind of mentioned there, uh, Bill, was is exactly what families are hoping to to hear from a school and they want to know what is it that, you know, what supports are in place, but also how do we allow our child to, to grow and develop that grit and determination uh, to really be successful beyond the walls here at Trinity Pauling. So I think ultimately what we're doing as a school is really benefiting a lot of our boys and, and not just here while they're at Trinity Pauling, but beyond. And so. Jeff, I, one thing for the alumni on the call, and it, it's definitely changed since I've been at school. I mean, a lot of the innovation is necessary because when I went to school, my parents, I applied, my parents put me up there and that was that was the end of it. The students today are, are demanding more. For, from from their independent school, uh, what programming, clubs, sports, um, how it's being taught in the classroom. So it's it's changed quite a bit since 30, 40 years ago when we were all there. They're, they're much more demanding, much more uh, educated in what their needs are. And I think that's one of the important things on the metrics that Bill mentioned is the innovation and adapting, but yet still staying true to the Episcopal Foundation, the community chapel, um, sit down meals and so on. So absolutely. Absolutely. Well, with that 
basic introduction, uh, you know, I would like to uh, share my screen uh, and uh, and sort of walk us through um, where we are with our strategic uh, vision of the school and talk a little bit about its origin and uh, and how we're moving our way through it specifically with regard to to this year. Um, so this in one slide sort of summarizes a strategic visioning process that uh, took over two years to uh, to create, uh, driven by the board, but also uh, working in a parallel structure with a group of faculty and administrators. Uh, we came up with five objectives that uh, that the school is going to focus in on during the course of uh, these three to five years of of the length of this particular uh, vision's life. Uh, and it's driven uh, around core values of excellence, character, community, and curiosity. Uh, and it is framed by a mission uh, that is not new to Trinity Pauling. It's, it's, a, it's a new way of articulating it. But Trinity Pauling School will provide an educational experience that makes a transformational difference in the lives of its students by enabling them to discover and pursue their distinctive gifts and talents. Um, and that is a that's an aspirational mission. Uh, when we were coming up with the words for this mission, it really was uh, was inspired by the the people around the table, sort of saying, you know. There's not a day that goes by that I don't think about Trinity Pauling and the difference that it has made in my life. And that's coming mostly from alumni, but we hear it from parents. We hear it from past parents. We hear it from teachers as well. And uh, and the five goals that we are working on and focused in on uh, would be mindset, teaching and learning, uh, resources, uh, campus resources, and belonging. And they are in no particular order. Uh, and the way, the reason that this is framed as it is in a uh, cyclical view is uh, is to de-emphasize a hierarchical nature of this. These are, are, the way I like to look at this are pistons in an engine. And uh, and for all of them, for the engine to really work optimally, all these pistons need to fire uh, and they need to sort of fire together. And uh, so we're going to talk through these goals, but really specifically talk about what we've done the, the past year or so uh, in working our way through this vision that was approved by the board at the end of September 2021. Um, the first goal that we'll talk about is a goal of mindset, which is uh, somewhat unusual for a strategic vision to have a goal of mindset, yet I think it's so critically important, uh, where we are working to develop a collective mindset that focuses in on excellence, trust, and innovation. And... Uh, and that is, that is something that that is built of uh, an idea of excellence is a cultural idea, and that is something that is all that Trinity Polling has for long emphasized, uh, but perhaps is not always talked about it. Uh, Eric, would you agree with that statement that we that we, that we're committed to it, but we necessarily haven't talked a lot about it. Well, I think when we did the strategic vision planning bill, that was one thing that most alumni uh, identified that a lot of times all these great things we've been doing on campus for decades, and we just haven't had the mindset of, of talking outwardly about it and letting the whole world know. And it reinforces uh, from the beginning of when we hired uh, Bill, the excellent leadership, the continu con continuity of leadership that Trinity Pauling has always had, the excellence in our faculty. And um, this mindset uh, helps us talk about it, focus on it. And I think also not just excellent trust, but also the innovation part is really important going forward for the school, constantly innovating and providing top-notch 
uh, education for for uh, our our boys at Trinity Pauling and become the excellence of, of boys education. So it's, it's a, it was a big, big one for, for the alumni on the strategic vision planning committee. And I would elaborate just briefly on on the the concept of trust. Certainly that relates to relational trust, the trust that uh, that exists between students and their teachers, teachers and their students, but teachers with one another as colleagues, as professionals, the trust that we establish with the parents uh, with whom we're part partnering, uh, who have entrusted the school with their most prized possession of their child, uh, and also trust in the continuity of the school and for the school to, to always be aware that uh, amidst change that is around us, uh, that there's continuity and stability that comes from a acknowledgement of what the school has always done well. And, uh, and that adapts with time, but to have trust in the strength of the school's continuity. And that gives me certainly uh, a, a, a great sense of confidence because the continuity of this school is a rich one. Uh, and from its founding philosophy by Dr. Gamage that really uh, developed and, and created a student-centered approach to teaching and learning uh, at a time where a student-centered school was not necessarily what the norm was. And, and, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, go ahead, Eric. So uh, I, I, I thought you'd maybe you wanted to also expand. I, a lot of uh, people use the word excellence, and I thought your your talk with the board about excellence and the definition as as you see it, um, how that's actually practiced at school. It, it's not just it's not just a word we're putting in there and saying, okay, we're going to be excellent in everything. Would, would you like to expand on that excellence proportion? Sure. Uh, I'm going to jump to this slide because uh, I think that, that that idea of excellence comes from this other idea of mentorship, uh, which speaks to relation, relational trust. Uh, and it also speaks to continuity. Uh, building a strong culture of mentorship is critical in establishing a culture of excellence. And, and what does mentorship mean? It means that uh, as a teacher, I am looking at my students with a specific eye of what their gifts and talents are uh, in a way that, that perhaps I can see them as, as a mentor before they can see that in themselves. But that culture of mentorship exists from teacher to students, but it also exists from experienced teacher at Trinity Pauling to new teacher and, and new employee who's coming into, this, into the school's culture. Uh, it exists uh, in the strength of the school's alumni network and, and reaching out to alumni who will be positive mentors to, uh, to students. And we'll talk a little bit about that here momentarily. Uh, but excellence, I think, you know, one way or another, it's going to come down to a mindset of, of being the best at, at what you're aspiring to, to, to be, to work hard, but also to excel in relationships uh, in a way that is authentic, uh, but is geared towards something that is transformational. Um, I want to talk a little bit about a different way to, to frame excellence around this idea of being student-centered. Um, you're looking at an aerial view in the lower right of the chapel and Johnson Hall. Uh, and that's how it, it, it looks today, or that, that picture was probably taking, taken in the early spring uh, when things were starting to become a little greener. Uh, but if you looked at that same picture from last year at this time, uh, where those green Adirondack chairs are now, those were all parking spaces. And there were about eight parking spaces in that green space. And we talked about that, Eric, at the spring board meeting last year, because, you know, 
we were talking about, okay, what signals of excellence, what signals of being a student-centered environment uh, are we sending or are we not sending? And when you have a view of the campus that students are walking through, this is the main thoroughfare, you can't see the academic building to the left or the dining hall further uh, down toward Route 22, but this is the main thoroughfare where students are walking back and forth through their dorms to their classes. And they're walking by a bunch of parked cars. They, you know, you can't see the buildings for the parked cars. So we removed those spaces to make sure that this, you know, this was space that students could use that that uh, that reinforced the idea of the campus is more of a walking campus because that's how the students experience it. Uh, it's not a driving campus the way the adults are experience. It's it's a walking campus. Uh, and that reinforces, uh, in my mind, a commitment to the students and to being student-centered. Uh, one of the things that we worked on last summer uh, was to uh, upgrade our hockey rink so it could be used throughout the course of the year. When we uh, last upgraded the hockey rink in, in 2007, every school in the Founders League was playing hockey from November until March. And so when we put the chillers in in place, uh, we created uh, an infrastructure that allowed us to play hockey from basically during the, the winter term of school. Uh, and that is not where hockey players are now. Hockey players uh, want to be able to skate when they can during, during weekends and, and so forth. We're not playing hockey year round. We still our strong advocates of uh, of having different different sports in different seasons, but when boys have free time, they wanted to come down and skate. So we uh, we figured out a way uh, through a uh, installation of a water tower that would increase the condensation rate in the rink, where we could start making ice uh, in late August and September. And so when the boys came back in September, they were able to skate. Uh, and the ice is still down today, and kids were skating last last weekend. Uh, that's a that's a you know perhaps for the hockey players it's a big example. But if you're not a hockey player, you know that you're not going to necessarily experience that. Uh, but what it says to me is that you know we're paying attention to where the needs and interests of all the students are. Um, I want to go no, back. I would add just even on, even yeah. on the walkway, talk about the walkway, the, 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 the around the quad, the brick walkway we just added, talk about mm -hmm. walking uh, the campus and making it um, more beautiful for the boys and faculty to, to experience the campus on a walking basis. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we did this past summer, and uh, I didn't throw any pictures in there for obvious reasons, but we renovated four bathrooms, uh, mm -hmm. three in the dorms and one in the, in the field house. And uh, that was perhaps the, you know, one of the uh, uh, most significant and uh, well lauded uh, changes by the students when they return uh, to see the bathrooms being improved and renovated. Uh, and the bathrooms that we changed in the field house, uh, no surprise, but now boys will shower in the gym where they haven't showered in the gym probably in three decades, uh, because now we have individual shower stalls in the gym as we do in the dorms where, where we've put, uh, we've renovated bathrooms. Um, more to go on that. I'll speak about that a little bit later. Uh, we did an upgrade to our dining hall and we, we created a different, different way for students to uh, experience getting their food. Uh, we wanted to get rid of the, the line to get a, you know, plate of food. Uh, so we've created different stations where the boys can go and get different food, that types of food uh, for dinner uh, every night. Uh, at, we do our family style meals now at lunches, and we've been doing that that way for about six years because it brings the entire community together, including the day students. But dinners, we wanted to provide more opportunity. Uh, and and that has become you know that's more student centered. We we've added more electives to our curriculum this past year to be more student centered to appeal more to individual student interests. Um, 
and the second goal or a second goal uh, for the strategic vision is focused on teaching and learning uh, and that the school uh, the school's teaching and learning experience will be forward thinking, vigorous and engaging in ways that manifest excellence in boys education uh, with emphasis on that last phrase of uh, the importance of teaching boys here at Trinity Pauling. Uh, you know, we are a boys school and we have been a boys school with the exception of about 15 years where uh, we did have girls here as day students. Uh, but primarily the school has been a boys school and, and we excel at teaching boys and boys learn differently. Uh, they, they learn differently from girls. Uh, good teaching works well in teaching both boys and girls, but boys, you know, really benefit from being more active in their learning. Uh, they benefit from being more experiential in their learning. Uh, they benefit from having a bit more autonomy in their learning. Uh, and we've worked to, to create that uh, experience and we're expanding in, the, in those areas in ways that I'll explain a little bit here in a moment. But just let me pause about why this is important right now. Uh, boys are in some degree of a crisis in terms of uh, learning as a collectively in this country. Uh, when, when colleges matriculate their new freshman classes in the fall, they will matric matriculate 60% of their freshman class as women and 40% will matriculate as boys. Uh, that ratio has been growing for the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, when I went to college, it was about 50-50, boys, uh, you know, men to women. Uh, this year it is 60, 40 women to men. And then if you look at college graduation rates, more women are graduating college than men. There are more women going to graduate schools than men. Uh, there's a higher unemployment rate outside of college for men than there, there is for women. And there are, mo there are many different factors for this, but one factor that, uh, that we're focused in on is that collectively through the larger educational system, we've not been educating boys well. Uh, we've been ed educating boys and girls in ways that they've had to memorize information, that they've had to uh, feed back information in ways that, that match a particular test, how a particular test is looking for that information or a particular teacher is looking for that information. Uh, they've not been learning in ways that are experiential. They've been learning in ways that have been more confining. That doesn't work well for girls either, by the way, uh, but girls have been, been better at adapting to that than boys. Uh, there's no doubt that this ratio of, of the, the widening ratio of women to men in college has been growing over 40 years because 40 years ago is when we started to shift a lot of these educational practices towards more standardized testing uh, and more drill and kill types of approach to, to teaching and learning. Uh, so what have we been doing? Uh, this didn't start this past year. We've been working on this for the past eight years to create avenues where boys are being active in their learning. They're getting involved with project-based learning but they're doing it in ways that appeal to areas of interest, areas of, of uh, areas that boys have identified that they that they may have an interest or perhaps a a, a passion uh, in exploring something more fully. Uh, and this all has been wrapped into something that we call the practicum, which impacts every student at Trinity Pauling from middle school to graduations, a series of graduation requirements. Uh, the boys have to work their way through all of this. And what they all have in common is the boys are, are looking to solve problems. They're looking to develop their communication skills. They're working collaboratively in teams. They're being creative in how they're solving problems. And they're having some degree of choice over the problems that they're solving. And, and all of that appeals to how boys learn best. Uh, for the last two years, we have focused in on the practicum being done during 
uh, the time between Thanksgiving and Christmas, something that we call winter session. Uh, this is the second year that we've done it in person. It was a experiment that we tried during the year that we were uh, mostly remote uh, and were, I'm sorry, mostly hybrid, where we had a, a large number of students who were remote, but all students became remote in that two and a half week period between Thanksgiving and Christmas. In the school year of 2020, 2021, we had students back. We were proud to have students back. But once they came back in August, they didn't leave until Thanksgiving. No weekend leaves. No, uh, no parents could go into dormitories. And, uh, and that was to, uh, of course, mitigate the, uh, the, the potential spread of COVID. Um, and so we did the, this practicum of project-based learning fully remote that year, which was uh, three school years ago, uh, two and a half calendar years ago. Uh, for the last two years, we've done this winter session here on campus. And what we've done is we've looked at how we can use time more productively. Two and a half weeks between Thanksgiving and Christmas, uh, not a great productive use of time for traditional classroom teaching. Uh, when you are coming off one break and you have two, two and a half weeks before another break, and the break is two and a half weeks. Uh, every teacher, if they were being honest, when, when the boys came back in January, had to reteach a lot of what was taught between uh, taught in the first two weeks in December. But it's a perfect time to do something different for a shorter period of time. And two and a half weeks allows us to do a deep dive into different forms of projects. Uh, so the boys are involved in team projects if they're younger. In, if they're juniors, they're involved in something called the Junior Collaborative Challenge, where they're solving real world problems in groups of uh, teams of five or six uh, peers that are randomly assigned. And they have to present their solution in a timed, filmed presentation that cannot exceed 12 minutes, where they all have to have a role to play. And if they're a senior, they're working on an independent senior project, uh, something they've chosen that they want to do a deeper dive into. And a lot of those seniors are working with alumni mentors, somebody who uh, has direct experience in an area of interest that a senior has, uh, but has an interest that, is, that an alumnus is pursuing as a, as a vocation or a serious avocation. Uh, and those relationships are being built. And so these are, these are you know, the, the practicum is one clear example of how we're looking at our curriculum differently because we are a boys' school. Another area that is in our second year now of rolling out are, are the Institutes for Active Learning. And these are four different institutes that the students will work their way through every week at Trinity Pauling. We have a Leadership Institute, we have a Citizenship Institute, an Environmental Stewardship Institute, and an Entrepreneurship Institute. And all the faculty are, are into, they, they sign up for an institute that they have an interest in, and then seniors select an institute that they essentially want to major in. And their institute choice will, will help guide their senior independent project. But the seniors, with guidance from the faculty, but the seniors are really leading uh, programming on Saturday mornings for the underclassmen to focus in on skills germane to leadership or citizenship or the environment or entrepreneurial skills. And they will be active uh, learning experience. We do that now instead of Saturday morning classes. Uh, we have found that this is a better use of that time uh, to get the boys active and engaged outside if the weather is good, uh, <laughs> but in, in creative ways uh, where boys can find relevance in, in the, the development of these skills. As I mentioned, this is in its second year. Um, and this past year, we, we took all the feedback we got from a year ago. We, we worked to iterate that, that feedback and came back with a, 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 uh, an institute schedule that was more dynamic. And we will do the same thing this summer. We'll get feedback, we'll iterate, and, and we will continue to improve this particular program. Bill, if uh, you may, real quickly, I think yes. that from 
uh, from from where I sit, the the educational landscape is continually started to shift and 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 develop, and um, it is shifting. It has been shifting, and when families are evaluating schools, uh, a school like Trinity Paul, and they want to understand that when we say we're student centered, or they we say we we have an active or an engaged learning environment, uh, I feel like we're pretty fortunate to have very clear objectives, very clear ways in which we act you know, engage our boys. And the two examples that you just gave right there are uh, specific programs that we have, but it also extends into the classroom and how how our faculty uh, connect with those students as well. So creating that sense of, of the ability to take that knowledge that is widely available, but also then learn how to apply it and also use it in a, in a collaborative sense and communicate it is, is, is really what is allowing these boys to be effective uh, as learners in the 21st century, right? Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, another strategic goal that we've been working on is this goal of belonging, that the school will nurture a community that is enriched by its diversity, inclusive, inclusiveness, and awareness of belonging. And that, I think, is something where Trinity Pauling has, has always aspired to, uh, uh, to improve and, uh, and to celebrate, is this sense of belonging. And uh, it really emanates historically from the school's Episcopal foundation, uh, the, the way that the school has always valued the uh, educational force and relevance of what it means to be living in community. And, and all boarding schools do this, uh, but boarding schools will differ one from another on how they prioritize this. Uh, at Trinity Pauling, we gather in chapel or in assembly four times a week. We're very intentional about bringing the students together. One of the things that's happened this year uh, is a marked increase in the students who are giving chapel talks. Uh, there have been probably more students this year that have given chapel talks than faculty who have given chapel talks. And, uh, and, that, and we've got a lot of faculty who give chapel talks. Uh, we've, we've, in the last three weeks, we've had about six students who have given chapel talks, a lot of them seniors who are, are recognizing that the time is, is winding down and it's something they've always wanted to do and they're trying to, to get it in before they graduate. Uh, and that's an opportunity for, for students to, to hear from different voices, hear different ideas, hear different perspectives, uh, and, and hear different experiences. And all of that is necessary if, if you're going to be living in a rich, dynamic community. Um, we gather, as I mentioned before, for family-style meals, as the alumni on this, uh, this webinar would remember, uh, where students rotate from table to table every three weeks or so, where they're getting to know different students, where they uh, are getting to know different faculty members. Uh, then, of course, opportunity for bonding that has always existed in the dormitories and around campus. Um, but through, through this goal, we've also sought ways to make sure that our curriculum is expanding, that we're looking uh, to ensure that we're, we're not sort of becoming uh, stayed in uh, how our classes are taught or the, the books that we're reading in English classes or the textbooks we're using in, in other courses that we're constantly looking and reevaluating uh, these choices from the lens of this focus on belonging, making sure that, uh, that, that multiple voices are being heard in that. Uh, we've develop, developed different uh, elective courses this year. We teach a, a course in rap music, uh, in a course in race and sports. There's a course in the history of the civil rights movement that was taught this year. In our American literature courses, uh, we've, we've added new texts, new reading to complement some of the texts that have always been, been read. Uh, to make sure that different voices, different experiences are also being uh, referenced and, and part of the learning process. Um, we've created uh, different uh, opportunities for different uh, affinity groups to come together 
Uh, and we've had, we have a black student union, for example, on campus. We have a Jewish uh, student awareness club. We have an international student group on campus. And this is not uh, in, done in ways that people are separate, but they're done in ways to make sure that, uh, that, that, that people uh, who are coming from different communities know that that community also exists at Trinity Pauling, but it's part of the larger community where everybody's voice voices are heard. Uh, and that has been very, very successful. And we know that at least because we're hearing that from students. We participated in a community and belonging survey uh, where students from uh, almost 200 different independent schools around the United States and Canada uh, participated in the same survey, and uh, and we we got data back that reference that that spoke to. Do you feel comfortable in your school community? If if do you feel comfortable with adults? Do you feel comfortable with if you're a new student? Do you feel comfortable with the older students? Do you feel that your voices are heard at the school? If there's a disagreement, do you feel safe in in working through a, uh, a mediation or, or a way to solve a dis disagreement. Uh, if there are in issues of bias or discrimination, does the community address those in ways that are healthy? And, and the way that our students responded, we, get, we, we received their scores. We could compare them against the aggregate of, of the entire sample base. And our student scores were, uh, we're above, in most cases, what the aggregate of of the rest of the almost 200 schools' responses were, uh, and that doesn't mean that that they're perfect, uh, but it does speak to a very healthy culture where students do feel that they belong, uh, that they feel that they're valued and respected, uh, and so this is a goal that we obviously have not just started working on this year. It's been something that we've always worked on, but we've uh, focused in a great deal on this year. Uh, and then another goal is making sure our campus resources are at a stage where, where they're able to provide a healthy environment environment that, that supports the, goal, the school's objective to be transformational in, its, uh, in the experience of our students. You see pictures of uh, our working farm, uh, and this is this, this was taken in the fall. Uh, these structures are now completed, uh, where we have uh, greenhouses and hoop houses up on our uh, acre farm that's just uh, beyond the pond area. For those alums who may may remember that those trails that went up the hill a bit, uh, we purchased all that property about four years ago. Uh, and among other things, it has our farm where we're growing vegetables. Many of the vegetables <laughs> end up in, in the school's uh, salad bar. Um, Eric, you re reference you know, this area, the quad area, uh, yes. creating spaces where kids to gather. Um, every corner of the quad now has sort of a, a seating area. And uh, and where the boys are sitting around the table is at the far end of the quad uh, that has picnic tables, places for students to gather and work or just to, to hang out. Uh, Jeff, you've taken a lot of, uh, or you haven't, but you've had students take other students on tours, prospective students. What's, what's the impact and the comments you hear back about the campus, specifically some of the new additions that have gone in? Aside from how great our tour guides are, uh, they do they do really appreciate uh, the the sense of community that the the campus feel the the flow of the campus, if you will, uh, to to use that kind of a word. And so I think that when families are walking around campus, they're recognizing that there's an intentionality to how the campus is designed. There's an intentionality of what we've added in in terms of these. Uh, key spaces on the corners. Um, and, and as I'm sitting here, and I'm sure you can hear from from your office there, the the outdoor uh, softball game going on. Uh, yes. the, boys, uh, <laughs> the boys enjoying themselves outside, utilizing that space as we speak right now. But I think that's something that when families visit campus, they they understand and see 
why this area of campus and, and why uh, we do what we do in terms of the design of our campus to, to create more of a uh, sense of belonging, as we talked about, but that mindset of, of we're in this together as a community. Uh, you may have seen this um, this picture in the in the previous picture that showed that uh, area by the chapel, but we uh, put a new roof on Johnson Hall this this school year, uh, and and this was done for a number of reasons, uh, but but really done by you know through the focus of you know the dorm really didn't you know it stood out in not a good way. <laughs> Uh, around a campus that uh, has a lot of peaked roofs, that has a very distinctive feel to it. And uh, and now the campus, through the generosity of a donor, uh, has, has been enhanced through uh, an improvement to this dorm in a way that, that many people think it's a new dorm, even though the dorm was, was built in the 1950s. Uh, but the students have have really commented on the impact that this this has had uh, on how they view the dorm. Uh, the students who live in that dorm, uh, they they love the dorm because it 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 looks like the other dorms. It looks like a, a building that they're uh, that they're proud to be in. Uh, and it has accentuated the whole campus. And I would say that this also relates to this goal of excellence, uh, that uh, you know, we wanna make sure that our campus is looking uh, like it reflects a commitment to excellence. Um, this was you know, a corollary project. Uh, this is a student for his winter project wanted to re-envision what Johnson Hall would look like. He knew there was a new roof that was going to go on uh, when he started this project. Uh, but uh, he, he wanted to say, he's interested in archi architecture and he wanted to say, okay, how else could we reimagine the space? Uh, and maybe one day it will look like this with student centers and, uh, and a, a library in there uh, as he is, he is sort of imagined this reuse of space. Speaking of libraries, this is what we've done to our library. This is uh, our Gardner Library and Learning Commons. It, commons. it has been totally reimagined from what it was before. Uh, it, it's a reuse of space. Uh, we've taken, taken the blinds off the windows to let the light in, to, to create a panoramic view of of the quad and the uh, south end of the campus. Uh, we have new carpets in there. Um, you can see uh, the the bookcases are a little bit smaller, reflecting the fact that, that we don't have as many books. Uh, we've reduced the, the inventory of our books, but we're reusing the space for, for gathering. Uh, these softer seats that you have you see there, every one of those seats has a, has electricity to it so students can can recharge their computers and so forth, as do the, these tall tables here uh, that you can see. Uh, down in the lower right, uh, we are, we're adding a coffee station that is going to go in there. And, uh, and so students next year are going to be able to go in and get a cup of coffee and hang out, maybe do some some of their work or gather there with uh, with some of their peers. Uh, and it's a place where faculty meet students. Uh, once we changed the furniture in this room and made it more sort of student-centered, uh, user-friendly, more comfortable, we changed the carpet, uh, students have been flocking back into this space in a way that they weren't. Um, and, uh, and, and so we know that we've made the right moves because the students are, are telling us that we've made the right moves. This past summer through a generous gift from the class of 1970, we, uh, we were able to hydro rake the pond, uh, clearing out the silt and the weeds from it. And you can see the lower uh, pictures there reflect a uh, the size of the pond that actually grew by about 20 percent 
uh, in its in its scope because we were able to uh, to deepen certain areas of it. And this is an area where where the boys use quite a lot. Uh, the boys fish in it, they swim in it. In the winter, they skate on it. Uh, and it's a place where boys just like to be. And uh, this structure on the lower right, that's, uh, that's an environmental study uh, building that, uh, that was also uh, partially funded or largely funded by the class of 1970. Uh, this fall, we dedicated the Benham family uh, terrace and uh, fire pit in honor of Tyler Benham, the class of 19, from the class of 1990, given by David and Penny Benham. Uh, David Benham is the class of 1964. Uh, and they were, the Benhams were looking for a way to honor their son, Tyler, who had tragically passed away a few years ago. Tyler was an outdoorsman, loved being outdoors. And, uh, and so this was their vision to create a spot where kids could gather fish, perhaps, but gather around a fire pit and enjoy being outside. And this has been very well used. We're planning a big fire uh, for the st student, uh, students on Friday night. The students are leading that effort. And that's going to be down at the Benham uh, Fire Pit and Terrace. But this is a place, even during the winter, kids were down there. Uh, having fires, roasting marshmallows, and dorms gather down there, uh, and using this space around the campus in ways that uh, where the, the the students want, where they want to be, and to be outside, which is important. You can see uh, dedication with a number of the the class of 1990 in attendance this past fall. And then the last goal is is financial resources. And uh, and this, of course, has to be a priority for the school to expand its financial resources to assure its leadership role as the next generation school for boys. Uh, we're in the in the early stages right now of planning for the next capital campaign. We're working through various different uh, consulting firms before a selection of for the firm that we will work with uh, to explore the feasibility of, of a campaign, uh, what the interest is from the alumni, from parents, from past parents, but they will be around these areas that we've sort of outlined. Uh, another big area that we haven't outlined uh, will be endowment. And that uh, if there's anything that the last three years have, has <laughs> demonstrated, and that is the critical need for a strong, robust endowment uh, to help when when you do get hit with an unexpected uh, challenge such as a pandemic uh, that thoroughly disrupted uh, the life of schools. Uh, so that'll be something more that we will be working on. But we've done a lot of work, uh, Eric, I believe, in the last year uh, yeah. through the board's guidance and leadership. Uh, to advance, uh, you know, a good year's work through on this strategic vision. Well, Bill, I was just thinking as you're going through all this that are you sure it's only been eight years you've been there now? Before I thought it went quickly, and now I'm looking at the presentation and just uh, how much has been done in the time you've been there. Uh, it's, it's what a wonderful place. And of course, uh, the greatest joy for me being on the board is coming back to campus and seeing the smile on the boys' faces, some of the boys watching them grow over the years, and the impact that the school is having, the transformation that's taking place on campus that both um, parents and alumni can be really proud of. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Jeff, I don't know if we, we have any questions. I know we probably have some questions that we haven't answered, so uh, happy to do that. <laughs> I, I was just looking through them real quickly here. I think most of the questions have been uh, been addressed. For those of you that have additional questions or, or questions have come up, feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A and we'll be able to get to them. Uh, but we did have a few questions uh, that seem to be from uh, some prospective families regarding admissions. So I'm happy to uh, address that as of right now. 
Uh, one of the questions was uh, asking if we are accepting applications at this time. Uh, and the, the answer to that question is yes. Uh, we, we do go on a rolling admissions basis uh, post that April 10th uh, return date from students. And so we will continue to accept applications from students. Uh, and then we also had a great question about how the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic, uh, our acceptance rates and yield rates have adjusted and, and shifted and changed. Um, and the acceptance rate, I think, across the entire uh, scope of boarding schools has, has shifted dramatically in the last handful of years with the, the proliferation of, of uh, the standard application online or uh, similar to the college, the common application. More students are applying to more schools. So instead of students applying to three to five schools, some students are now applying to 15 to 20 schools. Uh, and so that kind of skews our, our acceptance rates a little bit. Uh, but I think what we focus on are we want students that want to be at Trinity Pauling. And that means that we're focused on the students that we accept, how many of those students choose to come to Trinity Pauling. And that rate right now has, has grown rapidly in the last handful of years. I think in part because of what we're doing uh, from a, a teaching and learning standpoint, in part what we're doing from a belonging standpoint, the mindset, the, the campus that we have. Uh, and, and generally the boys that we have on campus. So the students that we are admitting are choosing to come to Trinity Pauling, which is really exciting. Uh, and the, the other piece to this is that we're seeing more boys uh, in my short time here uh, that are exclusively looking at all boy options or exclusively looking at boys only schools. Uh, and that's something that I think has shifted in the last handful of years. And that goes back to pretty much what we've discussed throughout most of this uh, most of this webinar about the reason why boys' education uh, is so important right now and, and why our focus on boys' education is helping our boys stand out as they go beyond the walls of Trinity Pauling. Uh, so hopefully that help, it helps answer, but I'll, I'll keep an eye out to, to some other questions here that come and, in. And Jeff, one of the things that I've, I've noticed as we've gone through sort of the data uh, through the admissions year, especially uh, those who have chosen Trinity Pauling, is, you know, we're seeing more boys who choose Trinity Pauling, but they were looking at co-ed schools. Mm -hmm. And they may have only looked at Trinity Pauling, in, you know, in the midst of three or four other co-ed schools. Uh, and they came here for whatever reason, while they went and looked at other co-ed schools, but they, many of those boys and families have chosen Trinity Pauling. Correct. Because of what they've learned when they were here about uh, how a boys' school is valued, particularly by the boys with whom they're meeting here. Absolutely, and, and I, Jim, yeah, go ahead, Eric. Jim, I would I'd say the one one consistency since I've been a student watching my boys go through, just being on campus this past weekend, the boys use the same language that we with brotherhood, family, community, um, and a sense of, a sense of belonging that has remained constant. Mm -hmm. uh, on campus and and uh, just makes that place even more special. Absolutely. The kids being able to visit campus and us being able to get kids into the classroom as they go through their uh, decision making process has has really helped our our admissions yield, if you will, and in, in students choosing us because they get to experience Trinity Pauling uh, a little bit more in depth than they had over the course of the pandemic. And I think that has led to to more students choosing us as well. Um, and, and there was a question that did come in. Is there a sister school that you uh, plan <laughs> activities with? Um, and that's a great question. Uh, we actually just had a handful of boys that went to prom this past weekend. Uh, but within the Founders League, which is our close ties, we, we do have a handful of sister schools as well as um, you know some schools that are outside of the Founders League that we will cross over with and, and have different experiences, whether it's educational and or uh, the more traditional kind of social events that we, uh, we, we, uh, we encourage our boys to, to, uh, to take, take advantage of and participate in. Other questions? And if not, I mean, I feel like we, we covered pretty much everything that we wanted to see uh, or that, that folks had asked in, in, the, um, in the initial uh, onset of questions there. Uh, you know, I, I guess the one thing that I'd like to really point out and, and, um, the admissions uh, office is, is doing everything we can to, to, to share what the experience that the boys have while they're here. And one, one of the questions referred to uh, faculty retention and the, the, the faculty in general. Um, and I'd like to, one, first and foremost, thank the faculty because without them, 
Um, I have nothing to share in from my office. And, and ultimately, it's them, it's the faculty that are connecting with the boys and mentoring the boys and teaching the boys and allowing those boys to grow and find their gifts and talents. And so I think that in that question about the faculty retention, I'm thankful to have an incredible group of faculty that are here to support the boys day in and day out in the dorms, in the classroom, on the athletic fields, uh, on the ice rinks, basketball courts, and so forth. Uh, that is what is uh, most important for our boys. So I think that that faculty retention, I don't know if Bill or Eric, you want to touch, uh, touch a little bit more on depth than that, but that's from my seat where I see. I, I mean, just as a parent, if you're talking admission as a parent, the relationships my boys had with faculty and to continue to have with those same faculty, how impactful they were. And my boys would probably tell you the best education they received uh, between college and everything else was at Trinity Paul. Um, the faculty work very hard. They're your dorm, as you know, dorm parents, they're your uh, uh, coaches, they're your mentors. Uh, it, it takes a very dedicated person to, to work at Trinity Pauling in, in the field of edu education. As Bill and I've talked many times before, it's, it's a vocation uh, to our faculty to work with those young men and to watch that transformation uh, from, from when they first enter campus to when they graduate is, is inspiring, quite frankly. Yeah, and I think I think the the retention of faculty, you know, certainly is always a priority for for me uh, as the head of head of the school. Uh, this is why we have a very strong mentorship pro, uh, program for new faculty. But you know, boarding school will have uh, a number of faculty who are maybe right out of college, two years out of college. Uh, and they may do this for two or three years, and then they decide, okay, I want to go back to graduate school. Uh, but they remain active with the school. I, you know, one of the consulting groups that uh, that we were just interviewing uh, had two people in its employ <laughs> that started their careers at Trinity Paul, uh, and they left. You know at some point to go and pursue other other objectives but they've remained close to the school we we will have a faculty member return next weekend for uh commencement because he was invited by a number of the seniors who uh who are who are graduating and he was here for four years but then he left to go to law school and uh and he's finishing up his second year of law school but he's he's going to come back here and he wants to see those those boys graduate so uh, the, the faculty retention has always been strong at Trinity Pauling. We do have some faculty that will go on and do other things, but as I said, they remain, they remain connected with the school for the vast majority of them. Um, and I think before we sign off, uh, I'd like to just share an anecdote because I had, uh, the prefects for dinner last night and I've been asking a number of the seniors, you know, you know tell me where you are in the last 10 days. And, um, when I began at Trinity Pauling as a young teacher in those days, uh, the seniors would leave uh, right after stepping up, which is our sort of internal graduation. And they'd go off somewhere for two or three days and they would come back for graduation. Uh, and, <laughs> and probably not a good, healthy, productive use of their time. Uh, but, uh, but that that was sort of the culture, and and you you know you you go and spend the last three days somewhere else. You'd spend it as a class. If I were to say that as I've done to to the students today, they would have thought, how you know that's that's just backward. Why would you want to leave here to experience the last few days with your classmates? Uh, and for them, the seniors, their experience with their 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 classmates are so entwined to their experience here at this place with the faculty, with, you know, with the softball that's going on right now. Uh, and, and a sense of space and place is part of their relationship with one another and with the school. And, uh, and as I project, you know, 30, 40, 50 years from now, you know, you know, what a strong alumni base the school will have. Uh, and we have a strong alumni base now. Uh, but when you have class after class that sort of 
you know, relishes and, and doesn't want to leave here. Quite honestly, they they don't want to leave. They don't. They're not counting down. They're they're sort of wanting to savor every bit of time. Um, that that I think is another metric. So we'll end where we began, talking about a metric. Uh, and I would say the strength of a senior class when they leave will be a metric of where their alumni commitment will be. Yeah. Well, again, I would like to thank uh, both the board president, Eric Olstein and, and uh, head of school, Bill Taylor, for uh, joining us this evening to give us the state of the school for Trinity Pauling, the, the academic year 2022-2023. Uh, and if you all have any questions, feel free to please reach out uh, to any of us, to, to myself in the admissions office. We're always happy to, to help connect anybody to, uh, to the proper place. But again, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your week. And uh, again, thank you to, to Eric and Bill. Thank you. Thank you all. Good night.